Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us tonight, those of you up in Cook County. We appreciate it. Um, for those of you that uh, are new to Four Seasons, again, thanks for being part of this program. Um, this uh, presentation is being recorded and it will be available online as well um, after this presentation is finished. So today I'm going to be talking about plant pathogenic viruses. Just in case you haven't met me, my name is Diane Fleva. I'm the Plant Diagnostic Outreach Specialist at the University of Illinois Plant Clinic. Um, I've met a number of people through Master Gardener trainings, uh, various presentations, first detector workshops, things like that. So for those of you that have met me, you know that I get very excited about plant diseases. Uh, for those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet, I hope I get to see you someday. I really hope that I can get some inf interesting information across to you guys today and also uh, share my, my love of plant diseases. I tend to be a very um, expressive talker, so I use my hands a lot, so it's a little bit different when I'm behind a screen, but I really hope that, uh, that you find this an interesting and also enjoyable and informative presentation. And it looks like Marion is having problems with their um, audio. I'll help him out, Dan. Okay, thanks. All right, so as a quick introduction to viruses, uh, just as, like I said, kind of a, a quick introduction or possibly a refresher. So viruses are infectious agents. Um, they are one of our four major plant pathogen groups. So as you may recall, with plant pathogens, we tend to have four major groups. We have fungi, we have bacteria, we have nematodes, and then there are viruses. And viruses are kind of weird because they, again, they are considered infectious agents, but they're not considered living. So there's a debate between if, you know, if they're living, if they're biotic, or if they're abiotic or not living. Generally speaking, we consider viruses to be abiotic or not living uh, organisms. But that's a little bit strange because if you think back to uh, if you've done plant uh, plant disease trainings or if you if you have a background in plant pathology, we tend to lump things into uh, biotic diseases, so things that are infectious, and then abiotic. And the abiotic tends to be more stuff like um, frost or chemical damage or flooding or things like that. In this case, because viruses are infectious, they are considered a in in our biotic group, even though they are not living. So that gets a little confusing, but really what's important just to remember is that they are infectious agents. And while there are some major differences between viruses and some of our other types of pathogens, um, there are, they, they have disease cycles and they, they persist in similar ways in some cases in the environment. And we'll talk about that as we go through the presentation. Um, in terms of what viruses are, they're very, very simple. So again, they are not living, they're abiotic. They're just genetic material, so DNA or RNA, wrapped in a protein coat. That's it. Some of them have a lipid envelope. So some of them have kind of a, a third structure. But even then, it's, it's two very simple pieces, just genetic material wrapped in a protein coat. So in the image on the right, um, the, the red kind of curly Q, that is the genetic material. In this case, this is RNA. And then the blue subunits, those are part of the protein coat. And as you can see, it all just kind of is, is put together and it forms this rod. And that's it. And viruses come in different shapes and sizes, but they generally are very, very simple. So again, they're not considered living, which means that they do require a host to, to reproduce. And we'll talk about that when we go through the disease, uh, the disease cycle. They also have slightly different naming conventions. Um, for those of you that are really interested in diseases or just in plants, which I think is probably more of you, um, you know, you'll know that a lot of our, our living uh, organisms have a Latin binomial. So there's usually a genus and then a species. With uh, viruses, because they're not considered living, there is no Latin binomial. They are grouped into genera and into families, which may have a Latinized name, but generally speaking, viruses are named after either the first host or the most important economic host that they've been isolated from, and then a symptom that describes um, the disease. And so I'll show you some examples of this, but because of that, they have very different names, and in some cases, they're much easier to remember than the Latin binomials, um, but that's just, again, a reminder that they are not biotic organisms. They, they are not living organisms. So in terms of how viruses spread, 
So viruses, if you think back to that picture I just showed you, is a rod. They don't have wings or legs or flagella. They can't get up and walk around. They don't float in the air particularly well. Um, so they don't have any of the structures that we usually associate with movement. And so because of that, viruses spread via vectors. And these vectors are really, really critical for these disease uh, cycles to continue. So a vector is just a living organism able to transmit pathogens and therefore able to transmit disease. And so there are a lot of different types of vectors, things like leafhoppers, aphids, thrips, other insects, arthropods, nematodes can sometimes act as vectors. And then I put humans down there and I bolded it because we are excellent vectors. And I think that we often forget that, but humans are excellent at spreading diseases, also at spreading insect pests for that matter. Um, but humans are very good vectors. And so just as a, as a reminder, as we go through this, that there are a lot of things that kind of feel like we don't have much control over that may be spreading these diseases, but humans can also be excellent vectors and we do have some control over that. They can also be spread uh, by tools. So they can be spread um, if you're using contaminated equipment or machinery. They can be spread by propagation. So obviously if you have an infected mother plant and you take a couple of cuttings, those cuttings are probably going to be infected. Um, some viruses can spread through seed and then also through the movement of infested material into a new area. Um, and that, that can be a big problem with some of the viruses that we're going to talk about on ornamentals. And then some viruses can also be spread by contact between plants. Uh, for example, viruses have been shown to be able to move between tomato plants if their roots are grafting together for, uh, as an example. They can also spread through leaf contact, although that's not the most common. So we're gonna go over a general virus disease cycle and I just wanna take a moment to point out that I'm calling this a disease cycle and not a life cycle because again, viruses, not living. Um, we're gonna go ahead and start, we're using barley yellow dwarf as our model virus. And we're going to start with our affected plant. So I just told you that the name of this virus is barley yellow dwarf. So I think you probably have an idea about what our host is and you probably have an idea as to what sort of symptoms you might see. So this is barley and as you may have noticed, our affected plant is yellowed and it's stunted. So again, the naming convention is, is different, but it can be actually quite, um, quite easy, quite nice. So we have our affected plant, a vector in this case, this is an aphid, is going to feed on the affected plant. That vector is going to acquire the viral particles by feeding on the infected plant. Viruses tend to be very specific with their vectors. So for example, some will be vectored by aphids, but not by white flies, or they'll be vectored by white flies, but not by thrips, for example. And certain vectors can only transmit certain viruses, even if the viruses are fairly related. Um, so this is actually a good thing because it can help reduce the potential for viral spread. If every insect could vector every virus, I think we'd be seeing a lot more viral diseases on our plants. So again, the fact that, that viruses are fairly specific with their vectors kind of helps reduce the, the potential for widespread. So in this case, an aphid is going to feed um, on the affected plant. It's going to acquire the viral particles. And in this case, it's feeding on the phloem, so on the plant's um, vascular uh, fluids. And for some viruses, the viral particles can basically just end up getting stuck to the mouth parts. Um, while with others, the virus will actually enter the insect and it will end up in the insect's salivary glands or some viruses can even reproduce inside the insect. And so the point here is just that different viruses are going to persist for varying amounts of time in their vectors. And so that's going to depend on the virus and the vector. And that's going to change how long it's going, the, the vector is going to stay infectious and how far it can spread the virus. So if you have a insect that acquires the virus and it just sticks to the mouth parts and you know, as it feeds on other plants, the viral particles all kind of fall off, then that insect is going to not be able to spread the disease as well as something that enters the insect, gets into the salivary glands and is therefore spread every time the insect um, feeds on a new plant. So in this case, the virus is entering the body of the vector and it's moved to the salivary glands. And the vector, is, or excuse me, the, vi the vi bleh, excuse me, <laughs> the vector is going to move to a healthy plant. So this is our barley that is not infected and you'll notice that it's green and it's much taller than the affected plants. So the uh, vector, the aphid is going to move to the healthy plant and start to feed. 
This will introduce the virus to the healthy plant. And once inside, and this can get very confusing, and I know on the screen it probably looks like just a lot of little circles and little arrows pointing all over, so I'm going to try and break this down and make it fairly, fairly simple. Basically what happens is the virus is accepted into a cell, the virus then releases its genetic material into the cell, that genetic material is then used by the cell to produce more viral particles, so more viral genetic material and more of those proteins that we saw earlier. The point is that vectors cannot reproduce without a host. The only way that, that vi excuse me, viruses cannot reproduce without a host. The only way that viruses are going to be able to reproduce is by hijacking cellular machinery and forcing the cell to start producing more virus parts and fewer plant parts. And then once all of these, uh, once the genetic material has been copied, once more proteins have been created, then viral particles will be released from the cell. And there are two ways that viruses can spread in the plant. There's kind of the, the slow spread. Oops, excuse me, I think I went backwards. There's the slow spread where you have an infected cell on the left, and then you have the red viral particles. And those are going to move to a healthy cell through the plasmodesmata, just these little channels that connect cells together. So what usually happens is initially you'll have infection, a cell will become infected, it will start producing more viral particles, these viral particles will spread fairly slowly from cell to cell, and then eventually those viral particles will be released into the vascular system, and at that point the virus goes systemic and the entire plant becomes infected. So in terms of virus symptoms, um, viral symptoms are usually not diagnostic, which can be really frustrating. So you're looking at your plant and you know it doesn't look quite right, but it doesn't necessarily give you a lot of uh, a lot of clues as to what may be going on. So again, they're usually not very diagnostic. They can have a wide variety of symptoms. Um, part of this is because most viruses have a fairly wide host range, and the symptoms can often vary by the host. And I'll show you a bunch of pictures of this as we go through the presentation. One thing that can be frustrating, I mentioned earlier with the naming convention, we'll have viruses that are named after either the first host that it was isolated from or an economically important host, and that's great. Again, barley yellow dwarf, you know it infects barley, that's not a problem. The issue is that some viruses have a very wide host range, and so I will tell someone that we tested their petunia for tomato spotted wilt virus, and they get very confused as to why I'm testing their petunia, for a tomato disease, but it turns out that that virus can affect a wide number of plants, including petunias. So, but the, the same virus may show different symptoms on different plants or different hosts. So that can be confusing. Also, the symptoms may vary based on the age of the plant tissue, when infection occurred, how long infection has been going on, the overall condition of the host, is it you know, stress due to other factors, environmental conditions, etc. So basically, these symptoms are kind of rules of thumb, but they're not super diagnostic. Viruses rarely cause extensive necrosis, although I will show you at least one example of that, but they rarely cause extensive just dieback. So here are some common symptoms. So we often have stunting or dwarfing. So in this case, in both pictures on the left, you have the healthy plant. On the right, you have an infected plant. And as you can see, the infected plants are much smaller. So again, stunting or dwarfing is a very common symptom. We often will get chlorosis or yellowing of the leaves. Um, this can be difficult to diagnose between this and like nutrient-induced um, chlorosis, for example. So in, in both of these pictures, you have yellowing of the intervenal tissue. There's, the veins themselves still stay somewhat green. And again, that can look very similar to the uh, nutrient chlorosis that we'll see like on pin oak, for example, or sweet gum. So that can be, again, kind of a, an indicator of a viral infection, but it's not super diagnostic. We can have uh, models or mosaics. Um, a mosaic is just a block of tissue that's a different color. So for example, the leaf on the right, you have blocks of, of dark green and then blocks of light green tissue. Ideally, that leaf should all be one uniform kind of medium green color instead of these you know, very distinct um, blocks of color. You can also have, again, modeling, which is basically mosaic, but on a 
smaller scale, and you can also have like irregular colorations, so kind of what we're seeing on the left. We can get ring spots. I think ring spots are beautiful. So the picture on the right, or excuse me, the picture on the left actually is a pepper uh, leaf. This was on a sample that was submitted to the U of I plant clinic. And I think that's really pretty. If I could go to the store and buy ornamental peppers that have ring spots, I would, because I think that's just a really uh, a decorative feature of this virus. But unfortunately, that's a sign that there are other issues. Um, on the right, that's papaya. So papayas are threatened due to papaya ring spot virus. And if you are at all interested in either um, genetically modified organisms or sometimes some of the controversy or um, legal issues surrounding genetically modified organisms, papaya ring spot virus is a very interesting story. Um, basically, most of, well, almost all of the papayas grown in Hawaii are genetically modified in are due to this virus was wiping out papaya plantations. A genetically modified um, variant of the papaya that could withstand infection was developed and has been used across the island. Unfortunately, the virus has uh, mutated, it's evolved to the point where it can overcome that genetically modified resistance. And Hawaii in general is very um, concerned. They're, they're not particularly friendly towards genetically modified organisms. And so there's a question about whether they'll allow the second generation of GMO papaya to be planted. Um, and so it's really, it's really impacting a lot of um, producers. And like I said, it's kind of an interesting story because it looks at both the biology, but also it talks about, you know, again, like some of the legal issues and some of the, the general public perception of genetically modified organisms, some of the kind of pros and cons. So papaya ring spot virus is, is an interesting story um, just by itself. And then we'll also see distorted growth. So leaf strapping, that's what we have going on in the bottom left hand picture. Leaf strapping is just where you end up with leaves that are elongated. A lot of times the intervenal tissue doesn't develop very well. So it looks like someone took a normal leaf and kind of stretched it. And so you end up with these very long kind of stringy or um, uh, not very well developed leaves. Rugosity is this texturing that you see in the upper right hand picture. Um, it's that wrinkling or bumping or kind of wart like texture that you'll sometimes see. To me, it looks like someone took a piece of paper, crumpled it up, and then tried to smooth it back out again. You still see all those little bumps. And then generalized other, which is very broad. <laughs> um, but remember, the plant cells are being hijacked and they are producing what the virus needs. So they're not producing what the plant needs or they're not producing as much of it. And so they're not producing these normal plant proteins and lipids, et cetera, which can cause very odd growth patterns. And so we sometimes end up with these, like I said, just generalized other distorted growth. One of the, my rules of thumb in looking for viruses is if you look at a plant and if you just say, that plant looks like it's growing funny. That is a, a potential indicator of a viral infection. Um, a lot of these growth uh, distortions can also look very similar to plant growth regulate or herbicide injury. So that can, again, kind of confuse things or muddy the waters. So in terms of general management, um, to reduce the risk of viral infections, we want to remove plant debris and weed hosts. Again, a lot of viruses have a very wide host range. And so by removing potential, uh, by removing these weed hosts, we're removing potential reservoirs where viruses could be persisting. You want to propagate from virus-free mother plants and use clean seed. Sanitizing equipment can be really critical, especially in production situ uh, situations. Reducing crowding, that can help, again, reduce that plant-to-plant -plant contact, which has been sometimes shown to, to be problematic with virus spread. And then controlling vectors. Controlling vectors can be very helpful. Remember, viruses can't spread if they don't have a vector. So there are times where um, insecticide applications, for example, are recommended. But that's not always the case because it's going to depend a lot on the individual virus, how it spreads, what its vectors are, things like that. So once a host is infected, what do we do? And really the only management for an infected host is to remove and destroy the infected plants. Um, I put prune on there with a question mark because I get this question a lot when I give presentations about viruses or I'm talking to people about uh, plant viruses. And theoretically, if you manage to catch the infection at the very, very beginning, remember I said that normally you'll have a cell that gets infected, you have some pretty slow um, spread at the very beginning, where it's just spreading from cell to cell through the plasmodesmata. 
If you could catch it there and prune out the infected tissue, you might be able to save the plant. The problem is that once it goes systemic, the entire plant is infected. And also re remember that these symptoms usually take a little while to develop. And so even if you cut off the tissue as soon as you see symptoms develop, that you don't know how long the virus has been present in the plant. So generally speaking, removing and destroying the infected plants is what's recommended. If you had you know, a super rare African violet variety that no one else in the world had, sure, let's try let's try pruning it out. Um, there are also techniques that can be done um, with tissue culture recovery because viruses are not able to get into the growing point of plants, for example. And so there have been viral, uh, virus free, get, certified virus free plants can be propagated from tissue culture um, propagation, but that's obviously not something that most of us have the ability to do like in our basement. Uh, but it is a possibility when we're talking about large scale production. And then I want, really want to stress that pesticides are not effective for curing viral diseases in plants. There are no pesticides that are currently available that will be able to recover a plant once it's been infected. So just kind of keep that in mind. Again, every year I talk to people that, <clears throat> excuse me, that, you know, will apply a fungicide or an antibiotic in the hopes that it will cure whatever viral disease is infecting their plant, and it won't. So just kind of keep that in mind. There's, there's really no reason to apply a pesticide if we're not going to get any benefit from it. So I'm just kind of going to kind of go through some case studies and talk about some common uh, viruses or some unique viruses that will show up in our, occasionally show up in our landscapes and give you some things to keep an eye out for and talk a little bit about management of these viruses. So tobacco mosaic virus, um, it's shortened to TMV. We often will shorten viral names to just the first letters. It makes it very easy to scribble down on a piece of paper. It can make it a little confusing because if you don't know that TMV is tobacco mosaic, it could easily be tomato mosaic or things like that. So as more and more viruses are being discovered, the names are getting a little bit more bizarre because we have to start really making sure we know what we're talking about. Um, but TMV was actually the first virus to be discovered, not just the first plant virus, but the first virus in the world. Uh, basically in doing uh, inoculation studies, uh, researchers realized that there was a viral, or that there was an infectious agent small enough that it could move through um, the mesh or the screens that they were using that were actually the filters that they were using to catch bacteria. So they had something that was smaller than a bacteria that could still uh, infect plants and cause disease, and that was tobacco mosaic virus. TMV has a very wide host range, so Solanaceae family, things like your potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, things like that, cucurbaceae, so our gourds and pumpkins and cucumbers, and then quite a, a wide number of ornamental flowering plants. So TMV is, is actually an economically important virus as well as being kind of a very um, uh, a nice virus to talk about since, again, first virus ever. <laughs> and so in terms of symptoms, we get a lot of mosaic and modeling, which probably is not a huge surprise. It's tobacco mosaic virus. Um, we saw the picture in the upper right already, again, those big blocks of color. In the bottom left, we have more of a model where we have finer blocks of color, but that still doesn't look normal. Um, that's a tobacco plant that should all be one nice, solid green color, and instead we're seeing these blocks of color, almost like pixelation. We will get dis discoloration and distorted growth. So on the left, they're showing that chlorosis that we talked about earlier, so that yellowing of the tissue between the veins. We also are getting yellow spots on the tomato, almost like a ring spot. Again, I think that's really pretty, but not generally speaking what people are looking for when they're looking to pick their prized fruit. Um, on the right, we're looking at an orchid. Again, we're almost getting like a ring spot going on where we're getting that um, the, the lighter green circles are appearing on the leaves. You're also noticing that the leaves are a little puckered looking or a little, um, a little distorted around those areas. And then we also get stunting. So TMV can cause pretty severe stunting. So in this, this image, this is taken from a study that was actually looking to see if milk could be used as a, um, essentially as a pesticide. Um, it was used to protect the plants on the right. Um, and I get this question a lot about milk, and we'll talk about it more as we go through, but in this case, 
these plants were planted um, in the field. The note control were just planted directly into the field. The ones on the right with the milk control, those were dipped in milk before being placed in the field. And as you can see, it was actually quite effective. So the milk was able to help protect the plants and help them resist the effect of the virus. Um, one of the issues with TMV is that it's a very stable virus. Most viruses are not particularly stable in the environment, but TMV is incredibly stable. And so what they were finding was that TMV can actually survive harvest and curing of the tobacco, and it can also survive being lit on fire. And so the issue is that in a lot of these propagation um, uh, businesses, you'd have people that would propagate plants, and then over break or over lunch, they'd go out, have a cigarette, they'd come back, and then as they continued to propagate, or if they were you know, snipping or trimming or um, like deadheading, they would actually be spreading the virus from their cigarette. And one of the first labs that we do with a lot of our introductory plant pathology students, we'll take cigarettes and we'll grind them up and then we'll try to inoculate plants. And we usually get pretty nice virus uh, symptoms coming out of that. So I just find that really impressive that this little virus can survive, again, pretty, uh, pretty intense um, uh, circumstances. And so because of that, a lot of the large production facilities have a very strict, like, no smoking rule, or you have to really sanitize your hands before you go back um, to working. So in terms of management for TMB, <clears throat> so things, sanitizing tools or equipment, soap or bleach works really well. Again, I put or milk in parentheses because it has been shown to be effective. It's not something that we usually recommend in your home landscape. Um, but some, some organic practices will use it. Um, removing and destroying infected plants. So again, it has a pretty wide host range. Solanaceae, there are a number of weeds in that family. Um, so you want to make sure that you are destroying infected plants, but also destroying any weed hosts that could be nearby. Cross protection is something that is not particularly common, um, but they have shown that Inoculating plants with a weaker form of the virus will actually help those plants resist the more virulent form of the virus. So something kind of similar to vaccines, although it's very different in terms of the biology behind how that works. Um, so cross protection is, is interesting and I think there's a lot of potential there. Again, it's not something that we're going to be doing in our home landscape. And then there is genetically engineered resistance to the best of my knowledge. I don't believe any of that is on market currently but they are working on genetically engineered resistance to TMD. Again, in certain specific crops, not something we're going to just be playing with in our backyard. So the next virus I want to talk about is Rose Rosette virus. Um, RRV is what we shorten it to. So with Rose Rosette, symptoms were first described in the early 1940s, but the pathogen was not discovered until 2011, which seems like a really long time to go between when we first noticed there was something wrong and we figured out what it was. And that is a long time. But again, viruses are very, very small. I cannot stress how small they are. They are way too small for us to visualize, for example, um, here in the lab. There are ways of visualizing them, but they require very specialized, very expensive equipment. And so, you know, unless you feel pretty com confident that you are going after a virus, that's something that you may not invest the time or the money into. What they found is that this virus is vectored by an aerophid mite. Aerophid mites are very, very small. We can see them, but they are quite tiny. Um, and they are so small that they're actually blown in the wind kind of like dust. And so this is technically kind of like an airborne or an air dispersed disease, but it's vectored in this mite that then will burrow into the growing point and start eating, start feeding. And as it feeds, it will then spread the, the disease. It has a fairly narrow host range, so only roses are affected. Um, unfortunately, this, this includes most of our popular roses, including, well, multiflora, but also things like grandiflora, floribunda, hybrid tea, and then shrub roses, including radras. And those of you may recognize radras rose is the generic um, for knockout roses. And so as we've seen an increase in roses being planted, I think mostly due to the popularity of knockout roses, in similar roses, we've also, at least I have started to see an increase in rose rosette, like in the areas of town that I tend to go and look at their plants. So in terms of symptoms for rose rosette, one of them is this abnormal red coloration of the new growth. And this is pretty, you know, 
obvious. If you look at that plant, you obviously have red coloration of the new growth or the new tissue. The problem is that for those of you that are familiar with uh, knockouts, that's really common. That's in fact not a, a abnormal uh, issue on knockout roses. And so this can make scouting for rose rosette somewhat difficult when our knockout roses already have this red coloration and it's a normal thing for them. So that can kind of mask some of the, the symptoms that we can look for. We also can look for distorted growth, a proliferation of prickles or thorns, and we can also look for witch's brooms. So in this case, this was a sample that was submitted a couple of years ago. Um, this was supposed to be a normal rose, and if you look at that, it looks crazy. Um, it clearly has way too many prickles. Um, it's, it looks like a bramble to me. It's so prickly. So again, this is something that you can, you can look for on, on the plants. Witch's brooms are just where you, instead of having um, like one branch coming out of a node, you'll end up with like four or five branches coming out of that same node. So you kind of end up with this, it's usually weaker tissue, it's thinner tissue, and it kind of looks gnarled or all twisted together because it's, it's all coming out of one area where it really should only have one branch coming out of that area. So you end up with this kind of distorted, twisted, just kind of gnarled mass of growth. And another thing, just as, a, as, a, as a, a note with rose rosette, rose rosette by itself doesn't usually kill the plants. It will decrease flowering and make them quite ugly and very prickly. So it kind of does all the things we don't want roses to do. Um, but it doesn't tend to kill plants by, the, by itself. The issue is that it does also decrease the host plant's cold hardiness. And so what you'll see is as symptoms get worse and worse, as the virus uh, persists in that plant and the infection continues from year to year, the plant becomes more and more susceptible to low temperatures and it increases tissue damage so you'll get a lot of dieback in winter and then eventually you'll often get the plant uh, plant death due to low temperatures although in some cases it almost feels like a mercy so in terms of management for rose rosette you can sanitize equipment with soap or bleach ethanol will also work make sure you're only planting or propagating virus free plants again i mentioned that i've seen rose rosette in roses around town um, every year I can find usually at least one um, rose bush for sale, like in a nursery or in a greenhouse or in a, um, in a commercial uh, like garden center that has symptoms that are characteristic of rose rosette. So just, you know, it, it's the sort of thing that the industry is aware of and is doing a very good job to, um, to try to make sure that, that they're not propagating rose rosette virus, but some still slip through. So you want to take, you know, a look at any of the roses that you are putting into your, um, into your garden. Removing unwanted rose hosts. So on the right, this is a picture of multiflora rose. It's actually um, a huge problem in a lot of places across most of the Midwest. Um, I've heard stories that people used to take roses that were infected with rose rosette and toss them into the middle of multiflora rose thickets to try to kill the thicket. I don't think that it works particularly well, unfortunately. But removing unwanted rose hosts can be really helpful. If you have roses and you love your roses, that's awesome, that's wonderful. But if you have a couple of roses and they're like behind the garage and you never see them, or you have a couple of roses, but like they never quite look as nice as you want them to and you think about replacing them every year, go ahead and replace them. So that way they're not gonna act as a reservoir, as a potential reservoir, for this disease, which then could go on and infect someone's roses that they really do enjoy. So again, if you've got unwanted or kind of neglected roses and that's just not really what, you know, they're not really doing it for you, go ahead and just take them out. It's just better as a preventative uh, maintenance issue. And then removing and destroying infected plants. You will hear that a lot as we go through this. So Tosco viruses, this is actually a genus of related viruses. Um, the three that are present in the United States, or at least that are important to the United States, we have tomato spotted wilt, or TSWV, and patients necrotic spot, or INSV, and then iris yellow spot, or IYSV. Um, tomato spotted wilt, we will see on a pretty regular basis at the plant clinic. INSV, we also will see fairly, fairly frequently. Um, these viruses are vectored by thrips, so again, fairly small insect uh, pests. Thrips infestations by themselves can be problematic for plant health, and then if you toss in that they can vector viruses, that's just great. They have a fairly wide host range, so TSWV primarily infects uh, tobacco, tomato, pepper, and some ornamentals, whereas INSV primarily infects impatiens, begonia, snapdragon, cyclamen, and other ornamentals. Um, iris yellow spot, I don't 
tend to see very often. In fact, I'm not sure I've ever had a confirmed case at the clinic. That tends to be more, well, irises and then also allium species, so, you know, onion, garlic, etc. So the symptoms are extremely varied, which again is not great when it comes to trying to diagnose them. Um, it's going to depend a lot on the species of host. And remember, I just said that they have a very wide host range. Um, and then again, it depends also on the age of the tissue, the growing conditions, etc. So some of the symptoms that we can look for, we can look for wilting, which again should not be a huge surprise. Tomato spotted wilt disease causes wilting. So this on tomato and then tobacco, you can see some pretty severe wilting going on in both of those pictures. We can have ring spots that appear on leaves and fruit. Again, I think ring spots are really pretty. The problem is that um, for the fruit, for example, on the left, the tomato and the bell pepper, the plants are not going to ripen e uh, evenly. They're not necessarily, they're not dangerous to eat, but the yellow areas, the ring spot areas just won't ripen appropriately and then you're not going to have a very palatable fruit. You can also have ring spots appear on the leaves, as we see on the right. With impatient necrotic spot virus, we will sometimes get, again, ring spots. So sometimes those will be necrotic ring spots, like what we see on the left with the coleus. Um, they can also sometimes just be discolored ring spots. So the hosta on the right, the, the kind of yellow-green color that you're seeing, that's the normal color for the hosta. And then the darker green ring spots, that darker green is actually the discoloration, which is opposite the way that I would have thought. I like my plants to be a nice, healthy green color. And when they're kind of an, a yellowy green, I get concerned. But there are a number of hosta that that is perfectly normal. And in this case, that again, that kind of yellow-green chartreuse color is the color it should be. And then the darker green is the discoloration. And then we can also get fairly large areas of necrosis. I mentioned earlier that viruses rarely cause widespread necrosis. And then I said that there is at least one exception I could think of. This is that exception. Um, here we have on the coleus. You can notice that it looks like there was an initial infection. So the spot on the left looks like it was one probably infection. So you have that, that kind of round ring spot um, discoloration. Whereas on the right, it looks like there may have been multiple and then they kind of coalesced into a much larger um, irregular lesion. And then on the far right, we just have kind of more generalized um, necrosis across that leaf. So in terms of management, removing and destroying infected plants. Again, that should sound pretty familiar at this point. Only plant or propagate virus-free plants. Remove weed hosts. Again, with a wide host range, there are going to be a, a wide number of weeds that can also act as a reservoir. Um, do not grow vegetable transplants in the same greenhouse with susceptible ornamentals. This is obviously more for production. The idea being that with um, tomato spotted wilt and then impatience necrotic spot, because they have they share a, a pretty large um, uh, host range, you want to make sure that you're not accidentally kind of co-infecting um, plants with both. And then in this case, this is an example where trying to control the vector, trying to control thrips can be very beneficial. Again, part of that is because thrips by themselves can cause a lot of problems to plants. Thrips infestations um, will cause plant damage, so you're going to want to control them anyway. Um, also, this can be really important in production facilities, so in greenhouses or uh, um, again, propagation um, rooms, you definitely want to be controlling those thrips so that you don't have a, a out-of-control infestation. All right, so Hostavirus X. I, I like talking about Hostavirus X quite a bit because, um, again, I think it's kind of an interesting story. So HVX, it was first described in 1996. And it was described on a couple of new varieties of hosta. So for those of you that are really into hosta, you probably know this. Um, but host, there, there are some people who get really excited about hosta. And that's great. I love it when people get excited about their passion. And so there are a number of hosta societies um, just in, these, in Illinois, let alone across the nation. And a lot of times with these hosta societies, people will get together. They'll talk about rare hostas that they may have acquired. They'll share hosta pictures. And then at the either beginning or end of the year, when you're dividing your hosta up, a lot of times people will bring um, divisions in and you can swap out hosta. And that's amazing. I think it's a great idea. You can all get away from kind of the, the more standard green and white and go to some, some other interesting varieties. 
The problem is that there were a couple of people that had what they thought were genetic uh, mutants. They're called sports, and they thought that they had these kind of mutations that had appeared on their hosta, and so they kind of divided them to cut those, those mutations out, and then they would propagate those. And some of them were really pretty. They had different, um, different variegated colors, they had different growth patterns, and so they were continuing to grow these out, and then they would divide them, and then they or, and propagate them, and then they would share them with people. And in some cases, in, at least in some cases, they, you know, when, when Hosta virus X was discovered and hostas were starting to be tested, they found that some of these varieties, literally every single plant was infected with Hosta virus X. So in, in a number of cases, these were not new varieties, these were just varieties that were infected with a virus, which I find very interesting. And it's kind of a pity because again, some of these were really pretty. Um, the varieties will vary in susceptibility, so some may show no symptoms, so you can basically have symptomless carriers of hostavirus X. And then there are some that are very, very susceptible that will actually die. Um, a, lot of our, or a lot of hosta are kind of in the in-between stage, where they will show symptoms, but and it might weaken the plant a little bit, but it's not going to cause widespread decline or death, at least not quickly. Also interesting with HVX is that there is no known vector other than humans. So we do not know how this virus spreads in nature. I don't know if there is a you know, arthropod or insect or nematode uh, vector that we just haven't found yet. Um, if it is a very slow moving virus and only spreads through sap, only spreads through plant tissue contact, it's just an interesting virus because again, we're kind of missing a major part of its disease cycle. We don't know how it, it uh, moves in the environment. And then it does have a fairly narrow host range um, hosta are the only plants known to be infected by this virus. So again, that's kind of nice because it means we don't have to worry about all the other plants in the environment. So in terms of the symptoms to look for with HVX, we look for modeling and then this ink bleed symptom, and that's where you end up with these kind of lines of discoloration that look like they are um, bleeding into the plant. So kind of this diffusion of the color. Again, in both of these cases, in both of the pictures, the lighter color is actually the color that the hosta should be, and the darker green is the discoloration. So you'll get this modeling or this, this again, ink bleed, and, and I think you can understand why this is really kind of pretty. Again, I think a, a hosta that looked like that would be something that people would be interested in having in their garden. And so this is something that, again, made, made plants infected with hosta virus X very attractive for a while until people realized what was causing the pretty symptoms. You can also get puckering, which can be really difficult to see on hosta because hostas, a lot of them already have that kind of quilted or thicker texture to the leaves. Um, but in the picture on the left, if you look near the top of that, that, um, that leaf that's in the middle, you should see a little bit of like puckering or that rugosity that we talked about earlier. Same with on the right, you can kind of see areas that look a little more bumpy or a little more um, puckered than they should be. And then again, on very susceptible varieties, you can get necrosis and dieback. So in this case, you're having some tip necrosis where the leaves are dying from the tip back. You're getting obviously like a yellowing brown discoloration. Um, but this, like I mentioned before, this is not the most common symptom that we will see. So in terms of management, removing and destroying infected plants. Only planting or propagating virus-free plants. And again, much like with Rose Rosette, almost every year I can find one plant in a nursery or a greenhouse or a garden center that I usually buy. I try to haggle the price down, um, but I will usually buy it and bring it back and test it at the clinic. And they're usually positive. So again, you can find infected plants in the nursery trade. Once again, they're doing an excellent job at trying to reduce the risk of this disease spreading, but some plants will get through. So just make sure that you kind of examine the plants and you don't see any of those symptomatic, um, you, those symptoms that would make you, make you concerned. Removing unwanted hosta, same with the roses. If you have hosta that you don't like, just go ahead and get rid of them. Um, find something that you do like that will work better in that space so that you're not potentially um, going to start harboring this virus. And then sanitizing tools and equipment with bleach. This is especially important when you are propagating hosta. You want to make sure that you're keeping those, those tools very clean so that as you move, as you dig up one plant and you know chop it into pieces, if that plant is infected, you're not just going to continue infecting all the plants after that. 
And then the last virus that I have to talk to you about today is plum pox virus. And this is actually a, um, this is a regulated virus. It is a invasive virus. And so I wanted to include it um, just as something to keep an eye out for. We have not found it in Illinois. We do not hope to find it in Illinois, but it is something that every couple of years, there's usually a survey just to make sure that it hasn't snuck in somehow. So plum pox virus is also known as Sharka. Um, it was actually first described in Bulgaria, I believe, and it has spread throughout most of Europe, and it's caused a lot of problems on the stone fruits in Europe. It is transmitted by aphids and also the movement of infected plant material. So um, this is especially true when you have cuttings and people are moving plant material either for grafting or for propagation. Um, that's a great way for this virus to spread. Again, this is an invasive species. It is subject to federal regulation. It has been detected in three different states, Michigan, New York, and Pennsylvania. And it was declared eradicated in Michigan and New York, and it is under quarantine in Pennsylvania. The last information I was able to find was from 2016. Um, so it's either still under quarantine or the quarantine has expired very recently. So I know they've been making progress on eradicating it um, in Pennsylvania as well. So the hosts, fairly limited, which is good. Um, it's the stone fruits in the Prunus genus. So things like your peaches and apricots and plums and nectarines, almonds, cherries. Unfortunately, it also includes ornamental prunus. And so you can see why this would be a problem. Um, you know, if this is just in an orchard, that's definitely an issue. But then if you also um, add in the fact that ornamental or weed species can also act as hosts, that again makes this more of a potential threat because you've just kind of amplified the number of potential hosts and also the number of hosts that are going to be moving. Because again, this this virus moves very well in cuttings that are being used for propagation. So in terms of symptoms, the, the really important symptom is that we have fewer deformed fruit. So, well, I think that this is very interesting fruit and I would actually be kind of excited to find this because I would want to have it tested and see what might be going on. But generally speaking, most people are not going to be thrilled if their plums look like this. This is not going to sell very well. It does not look particularly palatable and they're not, they don't ripen very well. So this is the, again, the, the concerning um, symptom for most producers is the fewer and the deformed fruit. We will also get modeling and ring spot on the leaves and the fruits. Again, I say this every time, I really like ring spots. I think that they're quite pretty. Um, the picture on the, on the right, the peach, like, I don't know. I think if you, if you marketed that as a ring of gold peach or something like that, I bet people would be interested in, until they ate it and realized it wasn't ripened properly, but it's a very pretty peach. So again, viruses can have, a, have some ornamental value. It's just all the other things that they cause can be problematic. And then they can also cause ring spot discoloration on the pits. And even I will admit, I am not interested in cutting open a fruit and seeing that. That is not a particularly attractive looking pit. So again, this makes, um, it, it not only reduces your yield, but it also makes it much more difficult to market. So in terms of management, in the United States, we have quarantines. So um, APHIS PPQ got involved with the first detection. They actually have a federal authority to destroy infected plants and a buffer um, around that infected, uh, infected plant. And they have quarantined um, the regions where plum pox virus has been discovered. And they've actually done a really excellent job. And again, um, it's been able to be eradicated in two of the three states. Surveys are really critical. Um, in the states where it has been found, surveys are done every year. Um, for example, in Illinois, again, it's never been found in Illinois, but surveys are still usually done every three to four years or so, um, of, usually of nurseries and then also of or, um, ornamental production facilities, just to make sure that we didn't accidentally um, introduce it into the state. Again, the destruction of infected plants, often with a, plant, uh, a host plant buffer zone, that's as mandated by the quarantine. And then genetically engineered resistance, this is in the pipeline for plums. I don't know if we're going to really see that in the United States very much because, again, we don't really have plum pox virus in the United States. This could be really important, though, in Europe in areas where plum pox virus has basically made it impossible to grow some of these stone fruits. So in summary, viruses generally have a wide host range. Again, generally. Um, the viruses will have a wide variety of symptoms, and those symptoms are going to depend a lot on the host species, the age of the host, 
when it was infected, how long it's been infected, environmental conditions, conditions, stress conditions, things like that. And the symptoms may not be diagnostic, which again, makes it a little frustrating because then you're looking at a plant and you're not really sure what's going on with it. So if you think your plant is infected with a virus, what can you do? So the first thing you can do is just to remove the suspected host. Like that's pretty easy. Um, again, there's really no saving a plant once it's infected. So just getting rid of that host and destroying it, that is, I would say, the bare minimum. I would, I would recommend that. You may want to send a sample of symptomatic tissue to a diagnostic lab. Um, a couple of reasons for that. First of all, if it's a tree or if it's a bed of hosta or if it's a hedge of roses or a bed of roses, you may not want to destroy all of that if you're not sure it's a virus. You know, again, they, these symptoms can mimic other issues. And so getting a, a, an, a diagnostic identification can be helpful because if it's something that is not a virus, there may be management for that. Um, also, it can be helpful to help you know, you know, what else may be at risk in your environment. If we're talking about hosta and they are infected with hosta virus X, that is unfortunate for your hosta, but you don't have to worry about any of the other plants in your environment. If you have plants that are infected with tomato spotted wilt, for example, there are a lot of other plants I would suggest you keep an eye on. So again, the, the tissue or the virus ID can be helpful um, kind of for peace of mind and also to help with potential management, depending on what is, um, what is identified. So if you're going to sample su suspected infected hosts, the, and actually this bag the plant before removal, that's important regardless of if you are sending the sample for um, identification or not. Even if you are just removing the, the host and you're just going to destroy the host, you just want to get it out of your environment, you want to bag it first. And the reason for that is that again, most of these viruses are going to be vectored through small insects. And by putting a garbage bag over the top of the plant before you start to dig the plant out, you're hopefully capturing most of the insects. And so you're not just releasing them into the environment to then go and spread potential more virus. So you want to bag the plant. If you are just trying to kill the plant and all the, the vectors, the best thing to do is to bag it in a black plastic trash bag, tie it up really tight, maybe double bag it and then leave it in full sun, like on a driveway or a sidewalk, and leave it there for a couple days. And that will cook everything. Well, if it's in the middle of summer. That will cook the plant, it will cook the, um, the, the vectors. It's also a great way for getting rid of bed bugs. <laughs> um, but if you're just trying to kill something, double bagging it, black plastic, put it in a, in a hot, sunny location, that should do the trick. If you are trying to get a viral ID, you want to keep the sample cool, so you're going to want to send symptomatic tissue to a diagnostic lab. You want to, that's usually going to be the above ground tissue. So basically, you know, what you're seeing that looks kind of funny, the leaves or the stems or the fruit, you want to keep the plant tissue cool so you can refrigerate it. And then we recommend uh, shipping either via overnight or at least send it early in the week to avoid weekend delays. Because the worst thing in the world is coming in, on, coming in on a Monday and having a big stack of plants that were shipped on Thursday or Friday and have been sitting in a shipping container for several days. That does not make it easier to figure out what's going on. So in terms of testing for viruses, this can be a little bit tricky because again, I mentioned the only signs are viral particles and they are very, very, very small and require specialized equipment to visualize, which we do not have. And even then, if you can visualize them, it just shows you the shape of the virus and well, there are certain viruses are certain shapes. There's a lot of overlap. And so just seeing the shape of the virus may not be enough to identify it. So instead, we test for the presence of viral proteins or viral genetic material. And this is actually a test that's very sim uh, similar to a pregnancy test. We take symptomatic plant tissue, we grind it up in a buffer, and then we take this strip and we dip the strip in the plant tissue, in the kind of plant goo that we just made. And we let that, that, um, that plant material wick its way up the strip. And if you have one line, it's a negative. And if you have two lines, you're a virus mommy. And no one gets excited about that. I feel like I need to start handing out chocolate cigars. But I get excited when I see the, the, the two lines and then I feel bad for whoever, whatever sample I'm looking at. The problem with this type of testing is it can be, it's very specific and it's very sensitive. So that's good. The problem, though, is that it is so specific that usually we can only test for one virus using this method. And so if I test it and it's positive, let's say we're testing for hostavirus X, and we test it and it's positive, okay, 
your hosta has hosta virus X, we're done here. If it's negative, well, all that told me was that your hosta does not have hosta virus X, which is great, but it doesn't tell me what, what it does have. Um, and so that can be a little bit frustrating when we are testing plants and there's a bunch of negatives and you feel like, well, all it told me was what it doesn't have. Also, there are not a lot of these kits available considering the number of viruses that are present. And so if you are interested in sending a sample in for viral testing, I highly recommend that you contact the lab that you're going to send the sample to and ask if that virus is something that they can test for, or at least tell them the host, and then they can kind of look up what viruses are common and get back to you on that. Um, for example, we can test for hosta virus X at the U of I plant clinic. We do not test for rose rosette. We send people to the Oklahoma Diagnostic Lab because they have a protocol for testing for rose rosette virus. They've been doing it for several years. And when I talked with their diagnostician, they said that it was a very touchy protocol that took a lot of time. And I thought, you know what? We're gonna let them handle that uh, because they have it all set up and they know exactly how to run it on their machines. Um, so again, these sorts of tests can be very can be very powerful and they can be very um, effective. But the problem is that a lot of times we'll get a negative and, and all that tells us is that it's not present. So that can be quite frustrating. But we also use a lot of these tests for like phytosanitary testing, for example. So when people have plants that need to be shipped out of state or overseas, a lot of times other countries are going to say, if you want to ship your begonias here, you have to show that they are not infected with this list of diseases. And if it's a, one of those diseases is something we can test for using one of these, um, these kits, that's great because we can just test a kind of random sampling of the shipment, show that it is negative, and that will help um, that producer send their, their plants to the country that they want to get it to. And so with that, um, this is my contact information. If you have any questions, you're always welcome to contact us. If you have any questions right now, you're more than welcome to type them into the chat box. If, like I said, any come to you in the middle of the night, you can jump up and scribble them down and send them over to me. Um, if you have any questions about the plant clinic or the services that we offer, again, please get in touch with us and we, will, we can see what we can do to help with your plant problems. So again, thank you so much for joining us. I know Thursday night, right after dinner. I hope most of you have had a chance to eat. I actually am going to go grab dinner as soon as we're done here, so I'm looking forward to that. But thank you for joining us, and I really appreciate that you all came on and sat through my presentation. And again, if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Yep, thank you, guys. Thank you.